invite you, if you have a Bible, to go ahead and open it up to the book of John, the very first chapter, John chapter 1. We'll look at just a couple of things uh, at this, this beautiful picture of the coming of the Lord Jesus found in John chapter 1. Very thankful to worship on the Lord's Day. Of, uh, you know, it's not like a typical Sunday. I feel like I've been up uh, for hours waiting on uh, this to happen. Normally I start at main campus and I'm there around 645 and we have prayer time, then we have church starts at 8. Then we'll come here in church at 1015, then end up there. And uh, I feel like I have somehow cheated the system this morning on a Sunday. So I'm, I'm glad to finally be standing in front of you with the Bible open and uh, get to do some work. In John chapter 1, we're going to start reading. The whole, the whole chapter is beautiful, of course. But I'd like to um, read from verse 1 down to about verse 18 or so. So if you found that, why don't you stand we'll read together God's Word. <clears throat> Grass with us and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin now, verse 1. This is what the Bible says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness, that's John the Baptist, John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Do you join me as we pray? Father, I pray that our hearts would be filled with the joy of Christ, that this day might be a day of celebrating what the experience, the conversion experience brings us. And so speak clearly from your word to our hearts by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Very soon after this day, we get through New Year's and the feeding frenzy that most of us has been, have been on will be over. I don't know what it's been like at your house, but at mine, we have had food upon food which I don't complain about. I'm very glad to have food. Glad to have a whole lot of it. Glad to have some of the food that you have made, some of the baked goods that we don't normally have, having them during Christmas. But I suppose that my favorite and the best food group that we've had so far has been ice cream. I love it. I absolutely love ice cream. I, after supper, I like to have something sweet uh, after eating supper, I need something sweet after you eat. And so every evening after supper, I normally will have a bowl of ice cream. During the year, that is typically mint chocolate chip. I went from Briars to Bluebell um, because I felt like Bluebell was artificially green, but I got over it once I tasted it because it's so good. So I eat uh, Bluebell mint chocolate chip ice cream except around Christmas time. Usually around Christmas time, now that Bluebell is back up and running, it was a national tragedy when they went down. 
Bluebell now puts out around Christmas time something called peppermint ice cream that, that must have some sort of narcotic in it. <laughs> but because eating that Bluebell peppermint ice cream is an experience that, well, that you've got to go through to understand it. It's hard for me to describe it. I'm not a poet, so I can't describe how good it is. You actually have to eat the ice cream to know how good the ice cream is. Now, that truth about peppermint ice cream is also the truth about Christmas time. To really understand Christmas, you've got to experience it in a way that it was intended to be experienced. I really do think that Christmas must be genuinely experienced in order for it to be understood. So much baggage, we've attached so much baggage uh, to the Christmas spirit. It's not all bad baggage. You have times with your family. I'm going to be, when we get done today after church, I'll be with my mom and dad. We were with my mom and dad and my sister, nephews, everybody last night. So I think that is a good thing. That, that's good baggage, family and friends. But, but if you're not careful, the, the events around Christmas tend to crowd out the Christmas experience itself. So, so here's what I believe. Let's see if we can get through it quickly and hear what John has to say. Christmas. Christmas is about, here, here's what I believe. Christmas is about a life-changing experience with Jesus Christ. That's what it must be about. So let's take a look at this passage and see if we can talk about that life-changing experience. I'll give you a couple things to consider. Here's the first one, number one. Christmas, think big now, Christmas is a is a cosmic experience. Here's what I mean. When you look up at John chapter 1, you get to verse 14 of John chapter 1, notice that John is using this strange cosmic language. Hear what he says in verse 14? John tells us that the Word became flesh. Word became flesh. In this little passage, uh, the Apostle John is telling us that Jesus is the Word. If you were to look underneath the English into the Greek, there would, you would find the word logos. That word logos means the revealer. When he says that uh, the word became flesh, that Jesus was the word, he's saying that Jesus reveals to us who God is. Now, honestly, what you have here in John chapter 1 may be the profoundest page in Scripture. It is the heartbeat of Christianity for you and I to know that Jesus Christ is the Word. That, that Jesus will reveal to us God's mind. That, that Jesus will live among men and show us his perfections. That Jesus will, in the fullness, express to us God's will. That Jesus is the embodiment. He can lay bare for us the heart of God. The, the, the word logos, that is, a, um, that is the divine title. That he is all God. But verse 14 tells us that the logos, the word, became flesh. That, that word flesh, that would give us the human title. This is part of our essential uh, doctrine as Christians, part of what makes us Christian is believing that the baby born and put in a manger was all God and all man. That he is forever and forevermore shall be the God man. And so as the word, think of it like this. As the word, he is the son of God. As the flesh, he is the son of man. The Bible would say it like this, as flesh, in the Old Testament, he is the woman's seed. As the word, he would be the wonderful counselor. As flesh, the Old Testament would say, he would be a prophet like Moses. As the word, he would be the mighty God. As the flesh, he would be a descendant of David. As the word, he would be the everlasting father. As the flesh... 
He would be a man of sorrows as the word. He would be the prince of peace. You see, you see the text tells us that the word became flesh. It is, a, it is a cosmic experience. It's good for us and it's good for you that are children here to, to, to understand that this great God became finite. That, that that which is invisible, you can't see, became something that is tangible. That the, that the unknown became knowable. That that which is far off has been drawn near. That the unsearchable is something you can actually see and, and know and behold. That the Word became flesh, a cosmic experience. Something else to consider from this passage, not only is Christmas a cosmic experience, Christmas is a supernatural experience. Let me show you where I get that in the text. Verse 14, uh, John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, dwelt among us. That word dwelt, they came here, stayed with us. If you've got any family that have come from out of town, they are dwelling among you which may not be a good analogy because in a little while you might be glad for them to go back home. Tomorrow, Connie and I and me and Connie and Nate get in the car and we'll drive to South Mississippi and there in South Mississippi we'll stay at her mom and dad's house and we'll dwell among them. We'll be there. That word dwell, uh, it corresponds with the, the word in the Old Testament. You might know it as the word tabernacle. That, that word tabernacle means to pitch your tent to go into a community and to live there. So what the tabernacle was in the Old Testament, where people would meet with God and God would come down and meet with them, what the tabernacle was in the Old Testament, Jesus is in the New Testament. That is God residing with man. It's good for us to gather on the Lord's Day on a Sunday that typically is where you celebrate the resurrection. Every Sunday is sort of practice for Easter Sunday because Sunday is the Lord's day. Went from worshiping on Saturday as Jews to worshiping on Sunday as Christians because that is where we celebrate life. But this Sunday is the Sunday that brings together the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. That reminds us that Christ became one of us. That he came into the human condition, came into our condition, a condition of weakness. And although he was without sin, he came into a world of sin, of chaos. You know, Christmas is a good time. We'll put a little parenthesis around the regular ebb and flow of life. But when you take that parenthesis off, oftentimes it's just chaos. And into this chaos, God pitched his tent. And he did that in the person of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, for those of you that like to study the Bible, you might remember that in the Old Testament, uh, the tabernacle, that's where, that's where God would meet with his people. But it wasn't a permanent structure. Now in the New Testament, we believe in the New Testament, the New Testament teaches us that if God is going to meet with his people, he does it in the person of Jesus. The, the full counsel of God's word, we believe that, that every book in the Bible points us to Jesus. That, that the only place, in fact, we'll go so far as to say, that's why, that's why Christmas is, is so specific to Christianity and it's so necessary for us to hold on to the doctrine of the virgin birth, the doctrine of the incarnation. Why do we hold on to that? Because this presents to us not just the, the dying on the cross of someone, but Jesus as the second person of the Trinity, God himself becoming flesh. And, and there, God will meet with man. In fact, the Bible shows us that there, there's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. You see, in Jesus, and this is something for us to consider on Christmas Day, in Jesus, God has descended and dwelt among us. You understand that as a determined and loving father, 
oftentimes we, we preach the Old Testament, and we should. We have to preach the whole counsel of God's Word. We think about the judgment of God. But, but Christmas is for us remembering that, that God serves as a, as a determined, loving Father seeking reconciliation. It, it's appropriate that Christmas becomes such a great time of reconciliation for people. We can reach all the way back in our own American history to World War I when the Germans and the Americans stopped fighting the Allies and the, and the Germans and, and, and sang carols together. Reconciliation. Because Christ brings God to us. And not just as a, as a picture of us being reconciled to God, but as a model for us being reconciled to one another. Jesus reconciling men and women, reconciling you to God. You, you understand that Christmas reminds us that, that our God, who is so good and created everything, that he's, He seeks reconciliation with sinners. His desire is, is to draw men and women to Himself. And he does that through Jesus. Look, for, for struggling people, for, for struggling people during Christmas, for, for hurting people in Christmas, and that's why I, um, I know there is a, a debate going on, and, and I hope that the, me celebrating the fact that we're having church on Christmas, it, it's not meant as a backhanded slap against other churches that are not um, having services on Christmas. I, I don't understand it. But it's not my place to cast shadow or judgment on them. I'm not doing that at all. But I do think that it's, when you think about single people or, or people that are without their families and they can't make it home for Christmas, one, one of the great places you can go on Christmas Day when it falls on a Sunday is the church and, and be with your family. Family, a family, of, even if you don't belong to it, if you're a Christian, you do belong. And so you can there celebrate. And so for, for the brokenhearted and for those that are alone, he, he dwells. Don't, don't forget now that Christmas is about not just this big God, the Word becoming flesh, but the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That he tabernacle, he meets with his people. It's a cosmic and and supernatural experience. Let me give you a third thing to think about when it comes to Christmas. Um, number three, Christmas has to be a personal experience. Personal experience. Let me show you where I get that. You'll find it in verse 14 again. I spent a lot of time in verse 14. The text says that the Word became flesh. You have to slow down to see it. Remember, the Apostle John is writing this. He had been with Jesus. And notice what the text says. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here's what John says. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. We've seen it. Your, your translation might say, we have beheld his glory. Think about who's writing this now. This is the Apostle John. The Apostle John is speaking from his own personal experience. When you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John who, who wrote this Gospel. What, what John is saying is, Hey, look, I'm, I'm telling you this about Jesus. I was there. I, I saw the miracles. I watched when Lazarus was called forth. John, the apostle, was there um, during the transfiguration. Remember that? John was there. He's one of the three that went, James, John, and Peter, that went closer with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. John was standing back watching the crucifixion. John was there with Peter, the resurrection. John's saying, this is what he's saying here. Look, I, along with a lot of other people, I saw it. He's giving testimony to a personal experience with Christ. Now, let me make a translation over to where we are in 2017. Just as John gives testimony from personal experience, that is not, that can't be the sum total of truth, but it has to be a part of it. Just as John gives testimony to personal experience, so it is. For us around Christmas, it's important that, that it, 
that it must flow out of a personal encounter with the living Christ. In other words, we gather together as a congregation, and that is one body, but this congregation must be made up of men and women, boys and girls, that have had their own personal encounter, born again experience with Jesus Christ. Christmas has no meaning without that. Certainly Christmas is, is, is cosmic, it's supernatural, we look at all of that, it's, it's heartwarming, but it must be, it must be personal. And if that's not the case, let's make no mistake, it's also, it's also an expensive experience. Christmas is an expensive experience. Some of you are saying amen to that. It has been an expensive experience. I am completely broke at the end of Christmas. You can go somewhere and spend all your money and just get away from it before you, you know what happens. Or if you... Um, if you, if you have a family and you gather together for Christmas, a lot of time at uh, Connie's family will draw names. So you're not buying a present for every single person. Which if you're a kid, that's no fun. You know, you want to get a present from everybody. So you, 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 you draw names and you also then will normally cap, cap what it costs. So we're going to spend $20. Uh, this is your name. You get this. Don't spend more than $20. That is not the case that is not how God views it. The text says in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father. Only son. You might want to circle that. When, you, when it's written down, not just in English, but underneath it in Greek, mono, one, genes, born. It's written like this. There's only been one like that that's ever been born. The most spectacularly unique human to ever live. And to tack on to that, you'll, it says, from the Father. Now, oftentimes when it comes to buying presents, you might put a limit on it. At your home, you might put a limit on what you're going to spend on one another, what you're going to spend on your children, which, by the way, I think that is a good thing to do. You put a limit on what you're going to spend. Not so with God. That is not so with God. That is not how God has operated in this universe to reach us. And, in fact, one of the greatest Christmas scriptures must be John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That, that Christmas is, is driven by his love. That the Old Testament and the New Testament, both of them speak to what it cost the Trinity to save you. For, for, for God to do what he's done to save us. It was expensive. I use the word expensive, and I think I'm using it rightly because we've, the, the Bible teaches if you're a believer, Christmas is a good time to remember that you have been bought with a price and the currency, the currency is the blood of Jesus. An expensive experience. Notice with me also about Christmas. Christmas should be a balancing Experience balancing. Let me go back to the text in verse 14. Look at the verse again and read it. And there at the very end, you'll find where I get the balance from. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. You must understand that Christianity carries both of them, grace and truth. And there you have in grace and truth, this is probably not the form to do it, but you have two theologically charged words that we've got to hold on to in, in both hands. But grace in one hand, truth in the other. Grace and truth. Hopefully you have a pretty good idea of what grace is. Christmas is a good time to be re reminded of grace. Grace is receiving a gift that you do not deserve and one that you could not earn. A free gift. That's grace. And one of the prominent themes throughout the Bible in, in regards to salvation is that you, you cannot earn any of what you get. And although we exchange presents with one another, and that's a good thing to do, I like to get presents, 
like to give presents. At our house, Connie does all the shopping for everybody. And I shop for one, for Connie. It's the greatest deal in the world. I shop for one person. But the truth is that a lot of you give gifts to one another, and if you were to save up enough money, the gifts you get from people, if you had to, you might could buy it for yourself. And although you're thankful to get whatever gifts you get, and sometimes they're more than you would ever spend on yourself, if you were pressed to do it, you could, over the course of time, it might take you a year or so, save up the money, you could buy that for yourself. And so while there is at least some shadow of the thanksgiving we have to people when they give us something, some free gift, it, it, it doesn't completely tell the story. One of the prominent themes of the Bible regarding salvation is that, that you can't earn, even if you tried to get the gift God gives us, there's no way you could pay for it. We get salvation as a gift that is impossible to earn. In fact, Paul said it best, as he said so many things best. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, It is by grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. It's not as a result of works. Therefore, nobody here can boast. Grace. The grace of God is a gift, but that's, that's just one hand. And the other hand is the word truth. The grace of God is the gift of Christ and salvation, but next to this story is the word truth. And the word truth must be applied throughout the gospel. The, the truth, and the way I normally will do it on any given Sunday, is, is give the sort of the outline for salvation, God, man, Christ response. God is holy, man is a sinner. Christ died on the cross in the place of sinners, and the way that is applied to us is through faith. Now, now here's not the spot on Christmas Day with all the kids here. Here's not the spot for me to do a complete exegesis on truth, except to say that, that grace without truth, if, if you have grace without truth, you have universalism. That's not the gospel. If you have, if you have truth and all you have is truth without grace, well, that's judgmentalism. That's legalism. That's not the gospel. Uh, but the text tells us that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. That, that Christmas gives us this, this balanced experience that says the truth is we can never meet the standards of God. But the grace of God is that in Christ they've been met and that is applied to us. It's a beautiful, a beautiful truth for you to grasp. Here's something else about Christmas. I'll give you a, a sixth Maybe a seventh and an eighth. I have about 10 or 12 of these, but it's Christmas. My gift to you will be, I won't preach the whole thing. Here's number six. Christmas is a, Christmas is a permanent experience. Permanent. Let me, let me read verse 15. Let's get off verse 14 and uh, go to verse 15. Verse 15 tells us that John, he's speaking now of John the Baptist. John bore witness about him and cried out, this is the one of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. That's a little confusing. Uh, you read that. What exactly did John say there? Let me read it again. John says, this was he, he's talking about Christ, whom I said. Here's the statement. He who becomes, he who comes after me, he ranks before me because he was before me. What is John the Baptist saying. John the Baptist is saying that the advent of Jesus Christ is a one-time event with eternal implications. He's described in the Bible, this is our sort of our theological lesson on Christmas, he's described in the Bible as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. In fact, if you wanted to, you could back up to verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and, and just get a real sense of this permanent nature. Let me just read the first five verses, and then I'll just move on to the next point. Let me read them. The text says that in the beginning, think about this. We're going to start in Genesis, not next Sunday, but the next, and you will hear this same language. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. A permanent experience. Let me give you a, a seventh thing to consider. Christmas is also, and I hope this will be the case for you, Christmas is a reassuring, reassuring experience. You'll find that in verse 16. I'll just read the first phrase of verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. From his fullness. Where, where do we receive the power to get through the week next week? The, the reservoir of peace and hope and love. It, this is what Christmas reminds us. It's from his fullness. The reservoir that Christ has of, of, of peace and hope and love. It's deep enough to handle anything that you're going to wade through. Anything you find yourself in. Look, at, it's why we pray for people. Why do we pray? We ask God to reach into his reservoir and give peace to people that we love. Why do we spend time praying? We seek God to reach into the reservoir of forgiveness and pour it out on people's lives. Why do we pray for people at Christmas time? Is this going to be a hard time for those that have experienced tragedy the year prior? Why do we pray for them? We, we pray because in the reservoir of Christ. How do we pray for people that are sick? Thinking about a young lady that goes to our church in Maine that has leukemia right now. Why do, we, why do I pray for her? Because in the reservoir of God's power, we, in the fullness of God, praying that the fullness of God would, would overflow into the crevices of our lives. It's a reassuring thing to know that this God that came to us in Christmas has a reservoir deeper than any of my issues and problems. Let me give you one last thing. I'm, I'll wind it up here. It's not right to sweat on Christmas while you're preaching, so I need to turn it down a little bit. Here's the eighth thing. Chris, Christmas, Christmas should be and must be an everyday, everyday experience. Here's what I mean. You'll find it at the, at the end of the verse, verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Isn't that what it means to walk with God? Grace for today, grace for tomorrow. From his fullness, not my own ability, from his fullness I've received grace upon grace. Isn't that what we believe that the Lord provides what we need for each new day? remember back in the New Testament and Paul is writing about his own experiences and he talks about how he, he ended up having what he called a thorn in his side. We don't know what that was, something that was some sort of ailment. And, and Paul, he says, I asked the Lord to remove the thorn from my side. And, and what the Lord told him is true for us God said to him, as he says to you, my grace is sufficient for you. You see, the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ is understood through the whole redemptive story of the Bible. And it reminds us that as, as Christ has redeemed you, if you are a believer, he will sustain you. That, that the grace of God is not given it's not given just to sustain you through day-to-day -day issues. That grace of God is given to save you. Remember the way Matthew tells the story? Matthew tells us that the angel told Joseph, who would be Jesus' stepfather, the angel told Joseph, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The great, the great gift of Christmas is the virgin birth of Jesus, the God-man. The perfect life of Jesus fulfilling all of God's laws. The atoning death of Jesus on the cross taking the punishment for sinners, the punishment for our sin. He took it, the victorious resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Here is the gift of Christmas 
It is a gift that must be received by faith. It is my prayer as a brother, as a friend, as a pastor, that you will receive Jesus Christ this Christmas. You join me as we pray together, close out our time of worship. Your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of prayer. If God has spoken to your heart here on Christmas Day, you've thought through what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ. In a few moments, we'll have what we call a song of invitation. That is us inviting you to come forward, to talk to a pastor about what it means to give your life to Christ. Or maybe that doesn't, doesn't seem like something you want to do, but you would like to have a conversation after church this morning, our pastors will be out in the lobby and be more than happy to talk to you about what it means to actually believe in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. It is our prayer that you experience Christmas the way God intends for us to experience Christmas. Father, thank you for your word that is good. Thank you for the day to gather with my church family and celebrate the resurrection on the day we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And I pray that, that that truth would be applied to the hearts of men and women here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you stand, please, as we sing together.